Welcome to Lost in the Wilderness, a priest and a rabbi explore Exodus. And today it's a priest, a rabbi, and a Methodist youth minister explore Exodus because we're joined by Hattie Coer. Hi, Hattie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you guys doing? Very good, thank you. Did I say your last name correctly? Yes, you did. Oh, so I want you to know that work. you said your last name, and I'm like, who is that? Yeah, who are we talking oh. about? I thought about that. Uh, I, I've known Hattie since we were uh, in college as undergrads together. Yeah, which seems like a lot longer ago than it should be, I feel. <laughs> like, it has like, been. Ugh. It's been a long time. Are you guys past like 10th reunion zone? Like how, how long are we talking? Here? Yeah, I would have been at my 10th reunion this summer. I hadn't, I wasn't able to make it, but so Daniel's, you know, a few years older than me, but Daniel, Daniel was my freshman year RA. So I remember, uh, was he a good RA? He was a fabulous RA. He was. That's good. That's good. In all, the, in all the good and lenient ways, right, Daniel? <laughs> exactly. I definitely was most intense about quiet hours, particularly when I was trying to sleep. Uh-huh. Uh. And Margaret okay. was right next to Daniel, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, gosh. Uh, with Morgan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Who's still one of my good good buds, so... So there were actually, you know, it was interesting when we were at McAllister, it was picked as one of the least religious colleges in the country uh, by Princeton Review. But there were so many of us who ended up as clergy. Well, it's so funny to me and it's not people. I mean, I knew you were studying religious studies there, but there were so many other people that I had no clue that that was even like something relevant in their lives until like after school, I feel Uh. like. Huh. Like I started going to this, um, it's kind of like a Sunday night, like a Vesper service. I remember Sunday going with year, you. I think, yeah, or I must have been my first year then. And I don't feel like there were many people there that I knew outside of that service. It was a great place to be, but. Um, so what was it that also, called you? I also, I was going to say, I wouldn't have been able to tell you at 19 that I was heading into work at a church. Ultimately, that was not my, my plan at the time. Um, so what drew you to this wor- work? Yeah, sorry. I was working the summers during college um, for an organization called the Appalachia Service Project, which is a home repair ministry um, in central Appalachia. So based out of like Johnson City, Tennessee, but kind of in like rural Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee. I think they have parts in North Carolina too. But um, basically my role there each summer was to guide high school volunteers through a week of service um, and just building relationships with folks who lived a life that they hadn't really been exposed to before, um, who were experiencing extreme poverty, and then kind of facilitate some reflection piece for that. So as I progressed through those summers, it became clear to me that like, I had some work to do and some growing in the spiritual reflection piece, but it also became a much more important conversation in my own life. Um, and I had grown up in the church, but, you know, as like a kid who came and went. Um, and... After um, graduating, moved down to work full time for the Appalachia Service Project and had been there only about three months when this church showed up. And they're like, hey, we're looking for a youth minister and you're from Chicago and we're outside of Chicago. And what would it look like for you to come work for us? And I was like, "Ah, that's funny. Like, um, but started talking more and just I couldn't have told you then how clear it was that that was just the path um, that I was called to be on. So um, ended up here after a lot of thinking about it and talking about it and um, thinking about talking about praying about it at the time and, um, you know, landed here kind of as like an exploratory thing for a year or two and just found right away that it just met so many of my gifts and story and, um, ended up in seminary because of that. And really like, you know, all of it in a nutshell to make a long story short, (laughs) um, the, the opportunity to facilitate service experiences for people and, um, bring God into that conversation, um, and help folks think about and articulate what it means for them to be loved and be loving in the world around them, um, is really kind of my fit here. So, um, as the youth, the, the youth minister at this church, I get to guide all of their spiritual growth and service opportunity, but I really do a lot. I see, oversee all the mission and outreach for the church also. So 
work with a lot of adults through that process too, and really have worked hard to build that as like an intergenerational growing opportunity for all of us um, just to think of church and think of our spiritual growth journeys um, as something that happens all the time and not just when we're in worship, wherever that might be. So that feels perfect for our chapter today too, right? This intersection between uh, faith and living your faith and the like talkless practicality of dealing with buildings. Yeah. Right. Or how worship plays into action in the world. That's another thing we've been exploring in these chapters because dear listeners, uh, we are two chapters away from finishing, but we have reached chapter 39, a chapter that is so tedious that even the rabbis gave up. Writing <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, uh, famous, uh, Jewish mystical document. It really forms the basis of Jewish mysticism called the Zohar. Uh, and it is written theoretically as a commentary on the books of the Torah. And so if I'm remembering this correctly, the one on Genesis takes up two volumes. The one on Exodus takes up a volume and, uh, Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy take up all of, you know, three quarters of a volume combined. Uh, and it's the same idea, I think, right? You get all your big ideas out at the beginning and, uh, 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 maybe run out of some things to say here. So yeah, almost no commentary by the rabbis on this chapter. I mean, really close to zero. So are you saying it's hard to squeeze mysticism out of descriptions of an ephod? Uh, yeah, though, actually you'd think that it would be ripe for mystical interpretations. You would, you would, because it is worship, right? So it is. Well, I, th- that. I think maybe the point is it's hard to uh, squeeze mysticism out of the seventh description of the ephod. Yeah, that could be it. That could be it. Although if it was seven, that would be a highly mystical number. So oh, they're, they're <laughs> meta mysticism now. Yeah, exactly. So numerology going on here. Um, okay. Well, I, what I suggest we do is we start reading and then we interrupt each other frequently uh, with insightful comments and dumb jokes. Um, and, and also one question, I guess, you know, Hattie, I didn't say this beforehand when we were chatting, but I also work with oh. youth. Uh, and children. I'm an Episcopal priest, but my current job right now is uh, the director of children and youth formation at a parish. And um, one one of the questions I'm always wondering about is one of hermeneutics. Like, how does this apply to their lives now? Why should they care? Why why does this matter? Um, and it is interesting. Just just before my daughter left for her guitar lesson, she's 15. She was showing me like some stranger she's stalking on Instagram. I don't know if your youth do this or not. Um, But somehow they like follow a thread through people they know to those people's followers and wind up with some stranger totally different from them. But it's amazing the way that they read the symbolism of those images, like what people are wearing, Mm. um, what kind of emojis they use, what kind of products if they take, pictures of products for their Instagram they use that, that um, if you're only using pictorial representation in order to understand somebody, you still are interpreting and critiquing almost constantly. Absolutely. You know, and I think of just from the youth world, what they wear when they're in a house of worship and how little that should matter and how much it does matter um, both to each other. But then, you know, I, all the time I have, older adults in our congregation say, you know, I I wish I didn't have to look at so much skin when they're leading worship on a Sunday morning, or um, is that really what kids are wearing these days? Like what their presentation, you know, how it matters to folks when they're worshiping. Right, right. If only, if only there were a book of the Bible that would tell them exactly what to wear and all the complexity of how to make it. 
but holy cow, it would be expensive to craft, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. Right? Your youth budget would just go towards ephods. Uh-huh. I think <laughs> their parents might kill me too. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we, well, well, let's get into the spling. Um, Hattie, would you start reading as our guest? We usually make our guests be the first person to start reading. From the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary. They all... Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> To interrupt here, I told you we interrupt real early, early and often. It's well, you're from Chicago, you know how voting goes. Yeah. Um, So we're talking about expensive things here, right? Yeah. I mean, blue is the most expensive color to dye, I believe, in the ancient world. I would think either that or purple. Uh, And and I was hearing red too, is so all of them. (laughs) So all of them, yeah, 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 exactly. so we're dealing with something costly. Actually, it's continues to be true today that uh, uh, one of the threads in a talus and a prayer garment that Jews wear during prayer uh, theoretically should be dyed blue. Uh, and only some Jews follow this custom today. But if you have one that's dyed blue, they, they use the traditional blue, which has come from uh, ground up tiny little snails, I guess. Uh, and the cost of the talus uh, is about four to five times as much if you have that one blue thread in there than if you wow. don't. Um, I mean, it, it goes very quickly from a $50 garment to a $200, $300 garment. And uh, why can't they use some other blue dye? So <laughs> there are groups who do use uh, another blue dye. Uh, uh, in fact, the uh, um, Samaritans, uh, put it in their talus and they just use any blue. Uh, but Jews have this tradition that the blue comes from uh, something very specific. Uh, and it was thought that this snail had totally died out and didn't exist anymore. And so Jews didn't include this for, you know, upwards of a thousand plus years, at least not normatively. Uh, and then they have since discovered this snail again outside of Israel. So some Jews believe that, yes, exactly. Now we have to do it. And some people say, ah, this is not the same snail. And, you know, no one can get along with anything. Right. And some snails say, my cover is blown. I want to, I want to go back yeah. to snail witness protection. <laughs> yeah. seems so unfair to the poor snails they had like 1500 years yes. of just living their life and now they're back to being ground up yes huh. yeah i wonder if the natural selection will make it so there will be fewer blue snails and they'll lose their color or something yeah i didn't even know that a blue snail existed until right now yeah 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 hmm. uh-huh. all right well let's keep going go. <laughs> all right um, the, the second part of that first verse, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, they also made sacred garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. They made the ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. So they hammered out. let's talk about this. What is an ephod? Well, we so back when we first encountered the ephod, we uh, we put a picture on the website and everything. It's this oh, fancy, good. fancy priest garment. Um, yeah, and today at least we think of it as being this kind of um, almost shield-like thing that goes in front of the priest that they would wear dangling. Yeah, with all these stones, right. kind of like on top, right? Like of of your other. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, they hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made shoulder pieces for the ephod, which are attached to two of its corners so it could be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband was like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen as the Lord commanded Moses. They mounted the onyx stones in gold filigree settings and engraved them like a seal with the names of the sons of Israel. So they- I actually have lazuli stones here. Carl, what do you have? I have carmelian. They- <laughs> um, so it's another nice reminder, and we've encountered this a lot in these lists, that some of these words, we only have them in Hebrew in the Torah. They're not referenced anywhere else. So we don't really know what they're referring to. Mm. Right. Right. Maybe they were all snails. Maybe they were all (laughs) snails. 
Well, and I'm just thinking like how many of us really know the difference between what those would look like in our own world too, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure they mean anything to me. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, that's interesting. You'd have to be a jeweler. Yeah. Um, I, are you tired of reading? I, I could pick up from there. Go for it, Carl. Take okay. Away. Okay. And he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had charged Moses. And he made the breastplate designer's work, like the work of the ephod, gold, indigo, and purple, and crimson, and twisted linen. It was square. They made the breastplate doubled, a span its length, and a span its width doubled. Uh, I have a question, Daniel. So the fact that like the the sons are all um, represented here, the sons of Israel, does that mean um, that the priesthood is supposed to represent all Jews in a certain way? Yeah, at least this do- this not document this garment of the high priest is binding together all of them. Uh, so it's the sons of Israel, but remember that these are effectively the tribes that we're talking about uh, really disparate groups of people who in many ways lived very different lives, right? We're talking about tribes that were shepherds and tribes that were craftsmen and tribes uh, that lived by the sea uh, and tribes that lived in the mountains. And so, yeah, right. I mean, you got to think that this, the garments of the high priest here are serving as a unifying symbol, right? That everyone can look up, during the ceremonies and see themselves represented there. Um, but does it also reflect on the high priest in a way to say that, that this is kind of the Ur Jew in a way, this is a person who holds all the tribes within him or is that going way too far? Oh, interesting. I didn't thought of that. Um, I mean, it does say something that the priests can't come from any of the other tribes. Right. Uh, and in fact, the priests are not allowed to own any land, unlike the other tribes, which have ancestral lands. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so in a way, you know, there are tribes that are craftspeople and there are tribes that are fishermen and whatever, but you are the tribe that does nothing but God stuff, which seems like a sweet deal because you don't have to be out there working on the waves or whatever, but you don't get to own it. Yeah. And I would say, Carl, we've, we've read enough of these chapters to know that, uh, uh, uh priestly work is not necessarily the, the most sanitary. Work, right? <laughs> No, no, it's kind of gory at moments. <laughs> uh, okay, so going on. And they set it in four rows of stones, a row of ruby, topaz, and malachite, the first row. And the second row, turquoise, sapphire, and amethyst. And the third row, jacinth, agate, and crystal. And the fourth row, beryl, carnelian, and jasper, framed in gold in their settings. And the stones were according to the names of Israel's sons, 12 according to their names, seal engravings, each with its name for the 12 tribes. So, I, this is really expensive stuff. There's a ton yeah. of resources that are going into this. And I'm yeah. all for the idea that symbolism matters, particularly when you're trying to unify people. But when we're dealing with a group of refugees, is it in any way ethical to put this much funding into the garments, into the aesthetics of it? I don't know. I mean, it, maybe it's security in a way, though, possibly, right? Like, so because my uh, mother and her family were refugees, they often would, like, buy lots of jewelry, and they would always justify it by saying, this is an investment, right? Like, if things go south and the currency collapses, gold will hold its value, um, so this is our safety and yes, we're going to wear it and it's going to look frivolous because we're wearing it, but, um, it has a, another meaning, which is security after a deeply insecure mm. time. Could that be what's going on here? Or is this like the ba- like the, the garment as bank account for the people of Israel? Yeah, I, um, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking, I, I just keep hearing it as, you know, and I know I haven't been here with you guys before this week, but. Um, as investment in the future in a different way. Like we've been traveling and now we are showing, you know, the, the world around us that this is our most important thing and place. And we are here and it's going to be better than anything else that's ever been done before. You know, I don't know. 
Oh yeah, so kind yeah. of a celebration, like we made it, and like set us. We need to let people know we made it in this way that like nothing else in our lives will be as valuable as our God. I don't, I don't know. Huh. Right. I wonder if there's not a combination of those two things that you're saying there too, right? I, I'm thinking back to, uh, so w- one of the issues in the Jewish world today is we have Jewish American world, I should say, is that we've got these amazing, grand, luxurious, decorated, uh, often decadent mm-hmm. buildings filled with very few people. Yes, that is not just true in the Jewish world, I would say, in America. <laughs> <laughs> it's, totally. But it, in the Jewish world, there was a particular generation of American Jews who were often the children of refugees who had come to the United States that built these grand statement mm-hmm. buildings. If we were um, here. Right. Yeah. And I wonder if it's not some combination of what the two of you were saying there. Yeah. Also, I think um, it's just a a pretty common thing to put your wealth wherever you think God is, right? Or wherever God might be looking. In Puritan churches on the East Coast, they had this thing called the Eye of God, which was actually an eye painted on uh, usually the pulpit that would like look out at you while you were sitting there. Um, But you would be sitting there freezing your butt off because the church was also the town armory, so like all the munitions would be stored in the church. So you couldn't light a candle there in the middle of winter. Um, you know, and one would think, well, that's really weird. Why would you keep the munitions there? And it's because everyone assumed it was the safest place because the eye of God was looking at you. You wouldn't go and steal under the eye of God. So, yeah. So I, I, I think we do this all the time, right? Like we use um, God as... Uh, banker and as a jeweler and as status symbol, um, because we assume that things are safer, that God is kind of a vault for our ambitions, our hopes, mm. our stuff. I think, you know, I would take it just a, a different direction too, to think that I think we use it as like a, almost a power, uh, like an assertion of power too. Like I will, I will put my money where, I feel it's most valued. Um, so, you know, I feel like at least in my context in like white suburban Chicago all the time, like conversations with folks in our community are like, well, tell me why I should invest my, my resources in your church, you know? And instead of having a conversation about how we can collectively use our resources to better the world around us, it's like, I have this wealth and how, you tell you like vie for how it, I should best use it. Like, so. Yeah. I'm suddenly Hetty, I'm, I'm suddenly thinking of like candlesticks and stuff. And, you know, in our church, which have the donor's name, right. you know, giving in, in loving memory of so-and-so. And so I have this image of like somebody in the congregation in the temple pointing out at the, you know, at the barrel in the fourth row of the ephod and being like, I gave that in remembrance of you. <laughs> My mother. (laughs) I don't know. I think it's just interesting. Uh, Like maybe, you know, a way we've distorted this concept of like, obviously you would invest, you know, your first uh, income, whatever, you know, your top in the things that are most important to your soul. Right. But I think we've taken it further in our like consumer society to say like, well, I have, this amount extra to give away after and um, I'll give it to the most worthy cause. But but that worthy cause not necessarily being like the thing that's most deserving quote unquote, but instead the thing that like um, is the most um, sparkly or interesting to me. Yeah. Or status building. Yeah. 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 I mean, we see this on college campuses now. I don't know if this is true of McAllister, but Kenny and my, Alma Mater um, has been essentially rebuilt in the last 20 years, um, mostly because a famous and rich architect is an alumni and he wants to mm. 
rebuild the campus. <laughs> and, and much of it is good. Don't get me wrong. A lot of things are being replaced that probably need to be replaced, but some of it is just kind of... Yeah, scarce. I'm kind of imagining that maybe originally there were 20 so, tribes, but only these 12 paid to have naming rights on the ephod. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> rewriting the other yeah, eight tribes. Yeah, the other eight tribes. Ex- exactly. Um, <laughs> I, you know, this whole point's interesting, though. I'm at a congregation now which Davka does not have naming rights on anything. It's one of the few synagogues in the whole country, I think, where you walk in and there's not, you know, the Fleischmann Entry Hall and the Steinger. Torah Ark and the, uh, you know, the, the Carl's HVAC unit. And, um, <laughs> it, and it's an interesting thought there, though. But the flip side is, do the people who give, right, that is there some recognition that both encourages and is deserved? That is the question, particularly if somebody is doing it in memory of someone they loved. You know, like, I don't know. For me, that slightly changes the equation. I'm not sure why it should. I can't really justify it, but, um, but it does a little bit. I, I don't know that this is, I mean, this is a hard mark to know, but I feel like for me, it's all about your intention. Like if you're giving as like a status thing, like I'm using this money and I want this recognition or I'm, I'm using this money to buy this program or this specific thing that to me is different than meeting a need, like a felt need, I think. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you measure that. Right. <laughs> but like, so, so in, in this context, like, you know, this was as far as I'm understanding, like this was what was being asked of these groups of people, right? Like this is, you know, this is, they're being told, this is what we have to do together. Like this is what God is telling us to do. Yep. Um, or at least yep. how we understand it. And, and so they're, giving not for naming recognition rights, right? They're giving out of like our lives have been changed because of this story. And here's how we show it. Mm. That's beautiful. All right. Uh, Verse 15, Daniel, do you want to soldier on for a bit? Uh, On the breast piece, they made braided chains of corded work and pure gold. They made two frames of gold and two rings of gold and fastened the two rings at the two ends of the breast piece, attaching the two golden cords to the two rings at the ends of the breast piece. They then fastened the two ends of the cords to the two frames, attaching them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. They made two rings of gold and attached them to the two ends of the breast piece at its inner edge, which faced the ephod. We're sadly in uh, Ikea construction manual yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> territory here. Uh, They made two other rings of gold and fastened them on the front of the ephod, low on the two shoulder pieces, close to its seam above the decorated band. The breast piece was held in place by a cord of blue from its rings to the rings of the ephod so that the breast piece rested on the decorated band and did not come loose from the ephod, as the Lord had commanded Moses. I love that that's the line that the Lord had commanded Moses, right? (laughs) Don't let it um, fall off. Not get crazy here. (laughs) Uh, the robe for the ephod was made of woven work of pure blue. Uh, so again, more expense and certainly to the ancient ear, all of this would have been extremely luxurious. Um, the opening of the robe in the middle of it was like the opening of a coat of mail with a binding around the opening so that it would not tear on the hem of the robe. They made pomegranates of blue, purple, and crimson yarns twisted, uh, I love that. We still have these, the the Torahs traditionally are decorated this way today. And so we have these symbolic silver pomegranates that go over the tops of the Torah with all these bells on them uh, that ring as you carry it around. That's really cool. Any idea why it's a pomegranate? I, you know, I don't know the answer here. The word is pomegranate, Rimon. um, And pomegranates become a traditional Jewish symbol. I'd always heard that they're, uh, Jews traditionally say there are 613 different commandments that are found in the Torah. Uh, and so the Bubba Misa, the old tale is that uh, 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 there are 613 seeds inside of a pomegranate. Uh, I can tell you, Karen and I spent a Shabbos once opening up pomegranates <laughs> and can confirm that there were not 613 seeds in huh. any of the ones that we ate. Yeah. <laughs> How many did you eat, though? <laughs> we went through two or three. Um, 
Yeah, I think were there significantly less or significantly more? Uh, fewer than six thirteen. Okay, okay. fewer than six thirteen, but a lot of them. All right. So, like, was it a harder, like a a rich fruit? I mean, like a more expensive fruit to come by, more rare? Like, what? You know, I don't know the answer to that. It's I, I can tell you pomegranates. You know, here if you want a pomegranate, you get it in the grocery store. Right. Even today in Israel. If you're there in the right season, you just walk along the street and there are pomegranate trees everywhere and you reach up and you see beautiful ripe pomegranates above you and you pull one down. Um, And you certainly can buy them in the grocery store, but they're just, they're everywhere. Fruit of the promised land then, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I I keep thinking about the story of, uh, you know, the Greek myth of Persephone and Demeter. Do you know that story? I'm not sure. Tell me more. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so that <laughs> Demeter is like, what is she, like the goddess of fertility or something, and she has a daughter, Persephone, and Hades, the god of the underworld, sees Persephone and desires her, so he abducts her, essentially, and takes her down to the underworld. Um, but she begs to be let free, um, and Hades says, that's fine, you can, you can be let free, but you have to return to me uh, for however months that you've eaten seeds of this pomegranate for, she's been eating a pomegranate. I should have put that in there. Um, which is for, and this is an explanation for winter. So she goes back up to be with her mother during all the fertile months of spring, summer, and fall. But in winter time, she has to return to Hades because she ate four seeds of the pomegranate. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, pomegranates were all over the ancient Near East and Mediterranean world. Um, so probably lots of cultures had stories about them. Hmm. Hmm. They're today still considered one of the, uh, we call them the seven species uh, of the land of Israel. And so for the harvest holidays, we try to eat all seven of them. What are they? Uh, see, I, I had a feeling you were going to ask, so I pulled up, no, I pulled up Google before this so that okay. it was waiting here for me. Uh, wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, in particular olive oil, uh, and dates and particularly date honey. Huh. Uh, and you can find these all in, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, chapter eight, verse eight. I am really disappointed that blue snails are not on that list. <laughs> blue snails. One of the less appreciated fruits <laughs> of the Holy Land. Yeah. Because they can't find them because they're all being crushed. <laughs> exactly. They're just being crushed <laughs> everywhere. Uh, uh, where are the animal rights activists when you need them? Yeah, jeez. So these were the seven fruits that uh, the holiday of uh, Shavuot, the holiday of the first fruits, uh, when people, farmers would bring their offerings to the temple in Jerusalem, they would bring only from these seven categories. Ah, there we go. Um, and actually continuing our theme of blue, it was, uh, a tradition that the very first fruit on a tree that budded, you would tie a blue cord around it. And therefore you would know what the first fruit was that you would bring to Jerusalem. That is so interesting. So blue is a color that has something to do with first things or firstness in some mm. way. Yeah. That's because, you know, in, in the church, liturgical churches at any rate, mark the seasons with colors and the color for Advent, the first season of the year is blue. Yeah. I was just oh, thinking that too. Yeah. Huh. I, I have no proof that those things go together in any way, but I wouldn't be surprised. Well, it's interesting though, because I feel like a lot of churches use purple instead for Advent, and we yeah. there's several. I feel like even more recently, have been like we're going back to blue. Like it's that's more of like the newness and new birth, the new life, and hmm. right, distinguish it and preparation, the season of preparation. Yeah, right. yeah, and you know it's a penitential season, but it's not penitential in the same way that Lent is. Right. So. Yeah, I'm an advocate of blue, I guess. I, a lot of, you know, it, it means you have to buy more stuff. <laughs> so I can see what the objection would be, especially given what we were just talking about in terms of this ephod. <laughs> but, um, you know. I love this idea of the months having colors, though. Uh, yeah, not the months, the seasons. The seasons so there season. are 
distinct seasons, yeah, and they don't follow the order of months, really. Green is really long. <laughs> green is really long. We've been in green for a long time now. So it'll be Advent, and then it'll be the Christmas season, which is really only 12 days. Really? Um, I thought so the Christmas part- season was like three and a half months. That's the, re- that's the red only- and green Christmas season, the outside. Uh, excuse me, yeah, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> That's of the American <laughs> right. consumerist religion. Because I'm pretty sure I heard Christmas music on the radio no, last week already. No. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, good God. Uh, but following Christmas, there's the season of Epiphany. And following that, uh, well, actually, it's technically the season after Epiphany. And following that is Lent, and then Easter, and then the season after Pentecost, which is what we we're get, in now. Which we lasts get the one red Pentecost day, and then the whole season after. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. <laughs> I make every year with my middle schoolers, we make liturgical donuts. So we, we frost them with the colors yeah. of the church season. <laughs> Amazing. That's a cool idea. I like that idea. I might steal that. That's the only reason I know them, I think. Oh, there we <laughs> I go. I have to know how much frosting to prepare. That is awesome. <laughs> yep. All right. Anyway, what verse did we stall out on here? Are we in verse 26? Verse 25, I think. See, this is what happens when we start talking about food. All of a sudden, we're at donuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> donuts. Patty, will you, will you roll with it again? Yes. The bells and pomegranates alternated around the hem of the robe to be worn for ministering, as the Lord commanded Moses. For Aaron and his sons, they made tunics of fine linen, the work of a weaver, and the turban of fine linen, the linen headbands, and the undergarments of finely twisted linen. The sash was of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, the work of an embroiderer, as the Lord commanded Moses. So uh, there's a, I'm forgetting the name of this, but there's a movement in some types of Christianity where the pastors have to have like the nicest stuff. Right. What is this called? Um, Maybe the gospel. Prosperity right? gospel. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Prosperity. yeah. Prosperity. Uh-huh. Is that is what's that- happening here? Uh, I don't right. know. All of a sudden we've got the priests. Because I wouldn't even say that's just the pastors have to have the nicest stuff. To me, prosperity gospel is like you work hard and achieve money and celebrate it together. I don't know. Got it. Or if God loves you, you will get stuff. If that's true, yet yeah, that's there yeah. you go. Um, I, I I am not an advocate of that point of view. <laughs> so is that what this is though? Is this is this wealth a sign of God's love for the priest? Uh jeez, I. Y- that's a stuffer. See we. We we have no commentary here, so I'm just being difficult. No, 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 on no. I, well, if it were a sign of God's love for the priest, it's a pretty piss poor sign because the priesthood is going to get wiped out with the te- temple eventually. And and what does that mean? Uh, we've still got the priesthood in Judaism. It doesn't go away. We're 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 not actively doing this, but there's certainly. I mean, you can find amongst fundamentalist Jews in Israel those people, those priests who are practicing and getting ready because. Any day now. Are they actually sacrificing animals? Hmm. So they don't sacrifice animals. I mean, th- there are some groups that do. The Samaritans, for instance, have a Passover sacrifice every oh. year still. Um, but they're not quite Jews. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't believe they sacrifice, but they do all but that. And they train and uh, they've been working with ranchers in Texas to get a pure red cow. And because, of course, Texas. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, sorry, Hattie, you go ahead. I don't No, I was just going to say, I, I don't read it that way just because we've just spent pages reading about this massive wealth throughout this whole temple. So, you know, if we were coming from like, well, the people get this, but the priests get this, then that would be a lot clearer to me. But I, I'm just like, I don't know. I, I just am like, what? God commanded this? Really? Like, why? What was God thinking? Right? Like, why so much wealth in this darn building? Or, or darn garment, really, in this case. Well, yeah. this garment, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, did all the buildings the, the last four weeks or so. so. But right, tons of wealth being lavished on. That, you know, it's, and uh, your, your thought there, Daniel, makes me so uncomfortable because I, 
you know, I'm spending my entire career trying to um, dispute the notion that somehow being ordained makes you closer to God or more loved by God or whatever the case may be. I just, I just don't think it does. Um, so I sure hope that's not what this is saying. Uh, but I, I have no proof beyond my hope. Though it's worth rem- remembering here too, though I don't think it makes it less offensive, maybe more offensive, that priests are not ordained. Priests are a caste. Right. Uh, you have to be born into it. But this also, also this notion of being set apart for yeah. it, right? Which I think is a big conversation in ordination, like being set apart for ministry, for priestlyhood in a different way. And that conversation of being almost like called versus equipped. I don't know, not quite that, but I'm interested to hear more, Carl, about your work, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, I I feel that clergy are set aside for certain functions and that that is important uh, in some ways and a privilege, definitely. But that doesn't necessarily mean closer to God, right? Like you can differentiate between functions without presupposing that God discriminates in God's affections. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I could fully own my ordination in terms of saying, yeah, it's a, a great and beautiful thing to get to bless and to get to celebrate at the table and to get to anoint people when they're ill and pray for them. And I love all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, when I look in the mirror, if I ask myself, are you a better Christian than the people you just spent the day with? Uh, the answer is no, I'm not. <laughs> and if I stop being honest about that, uh, you know, I think it leads to a kind of horrifying narcissism. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this whole like Catholic Church report that just came out about Pennsylvania shows, I think, the end result of that kind of horrifying narcissism. Right. You begin to think that like whatever desire you have is somehow acceptable because, you know, you're better than everyone else and God loves you more. You know, it's interesting because, so I am not ordained um, in the Methodist church and I at different points have, you know, pursued it in different levels or spent, well, obviously I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I, um, it came to mean to me where I had to seek ordination in my current position and space in life that it would be a symbol for people, um, you know, that, that I was symbolically something different. Mm. Um, but I started to realize in this community that I serve and get to be a part of that folks already see me as a leader, um, as a, like a faith leader in their community and that ordination wouldn't change that in any way. Um, so in terms of like church hierarchy, like, you know, I don't perform sacraments in the ways that you were mentioning, Carl, um, but we have pastoral leaders in our church who do that. And I, I still get to be a part of the leadership of those in a lot of ways. So where am I trying to go with this? So I'm, I'm hearing this, this concept of ordination. I, I like, I really love what you're saying about um, this privilege and this opportunity to get to come alongside people in their faith story, but not be more or less than them in that story. Um, it's cool. Right. And I guess part of it might be a little selfish on my, on my part. Like I, you know, I am a person who has doubts and questions and places to grow and things I'm still seeking in. And I want to be allowed that. Right? <laughs> like, I think it would be just totally sickening to have to walk around all the time pretending that I was not like a, a living, breathing per- person of faith with all that, that entails. Um, but with somehow some perfected version. I mean, I think in Christianity, there's a reason why only Jesus is Jesus. And we don't say other people are like reincarnations of Jesus or um, avatars or manifestations. Um, because I think that's one of the things I like about Christianity is, you know, we really assert that, at the end of the day, there is only one charismatic leader in any community. And that, that leader is Jesus. It is not 
the the ordained person. And we are all students, so, right? Right. Exactly. We're all students. We're all f- flawed. We're all seeking. And uh, yeah, that's what it comes down to. I, I had a teacher who liked to say that the real power of monotheism is it lets you say that, no, you are not God. Right. <laughs> right. That is exactly <laughs> it. That, oh, that is so good. I like that <laughs> very much. <laughs> Um, do you think that the people looking at a priest in this garment, and I, I should go on and just finish the little section because it says, and they made a diadem, a sacred crown of pure gold and wrote upon in seal engravings, the inscription, holy to the Lord. And they put it on an indigo strand to, be, to put on the turban above as the Lord had charged Moses. So do you think that people like staring at this guy who's wearing all this bling and a hat that literally <laughs> says holy to the Lord are getting confused about those categories? <laughs> Being like, this person might be God. Hmm. Hmm. Or maybe that's part of the genius of the Holy of Holies, which only the priest can an- enter, which is... Uh, they can't get confused about that because they never actually see the person performing the most sacred yeah. rites and rituals and duties. So, in fact, it's not just that only the priest can enter. Only the high priest is allowed to enter into the right. Holy of Holies. And, in fact, we're told that a, a string or a rope is tied around his foot so that if he goes in and dies because only one person's allowed in at once, they can pull him out without having to go in. Right. So it is interesting then because there really is conversation about like a few set apart and only those are able to go meet with the face of God. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, these are the only ones, only the priests have the right and only in certain settings to utter the divine name is the idea. But of course, by Jesus this time, that's yeah. almost utterly corrupted, right? Because it, it becomes an office that in some ways is bought and sold. I mean, don't the, I, it, yeah, I mean, the the reality of how this is lived is so different, right? It, long before Jesus' time, this happens. I mean, wh- one of the great ironies is the Hasmonean Revolution, the, yep. the story of the Maccabees, uh, the, the Hanukkah story. They came in, and their big agenda was that the priesthood had been corrupted, and it wasn't the legitimate priests who were running the show. And so once they win this insurrection and take control, what is it that they do? They don't restore the rightful priests. They make themselves the priests. Right. Um, it's so interesting. I feel like that's just the story of history, yeah. right? With everything. Like, it's so interesting to think about, like, I can't even wrap my head around what it would look like done right. Like, if you're establishing a hierarchy to communicate that you have to communicate through, like, how how is that not meant to be hierarchical? <laughs> like, Yep. Yeah, totally. In some ways, it's amazing that the priesthood survived to the to until the Hasmonean dynasty, because you know here you've got somebody wearing all this stuff with a hat that says "Holy to the Lord," and no one before that point is like, "I want that. I'm just gonna go take it." Uh, like I'm gonna ways, wear the crown. <laughs> right, right. In some ways, that's pretty incredible. Well, I think they had. I mean, because the Hasmoneans are critiquing that the illegitimate priests are in uh, power. Right. So somebody already has so gone So presumably in. that's always been going on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that's even one of the reads of Exodus chapter 32, where we have the golden calf, that fundamentally the battle over whether Aaron was a good guy or a bad guy is about who the rightful priests are. Right. Yeah. Huh. Well, he keeps his position at least as... as for- far as the end of the book of Exodus. So, so <laughs> he's got powerful friends said Aaron. That's, uh, that's what he's got yes. going for him. Well, let's, well, you know, he's in a good family. Yeah. yeah. He's a nice boy. He comes from a good family. <laughs> uh, let's finish the chapter up. Uh, Daniel, you want to take us to the end? Uh, were we at yep. 32? Yep. Is that right? Thus was completed all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Those are words our listeners have been excited to hear for months now. <laughs> oh, boy. Probably Me not too. as excited as you yeah. guys, right? <laughs> uh, the, yeah. the Israelites did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses with the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its planks, its bars, its posts, and its sockets, the covering of the tanned ram skins, the covering of the dolphin skins, and the curtain for the screen the Ark of the Pact and its poles and the cover, 
the table and all its utensils and the bread of display, the pure lamp stand, its lamps, lamps in due order, and all its fittings and the oil for lighting, the altar of gold, the oil for anointing, the aromatic incense and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the copper altar with its copper grating, its poles and all its utensils, and the laver and its stand, the hangings of the enclosure, its posts and its sockets, the screen for the gate of the enclosure, its cords and its all its pegs, all the furnishings for the service of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the service vestments for officiating in the sanctuary, the sacral vestments of Aaron the priest, and the vestments of his sons for priestly service. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the Israelites had done all the work. And when Moses saw that they had performed all the tasks, as the Lord had commanded, so they had done, Moses blessed them. Woohoo! <laughs> good job. Good, uh, good ending reading. Uh, well, do we have anything more to say about this? Or are we... Have we tabernacled? The tabernacle. I, I think we've tabernacled. Um, I think somewhere near the land of Israel, a snail is rushing for cover. In a snail-like way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a snail hides under a pomegranate. As the evening wanes. <laughs> yeah, you say that, but let me let me tell you, as someone who's been there, there is nothing grosser in the whole world than cracking open a pomegranate to discover it's become infected with bugs. Ah, okay. Oh, gosh. I'm well, snails aren't bugs. See, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. how would it be to... If it was- if you cracked it open and the blue snail was in it, it would just be a purple pomegranate. That's very good. It would be it would be really quite religious, a religious moment. Um, okay, y'all. Well, dear listeners, we have one chapter left to go. And Daniel, you were saying before we got started that um, in Shavuta Bible study, it is a, actually a commandment that uh, once a Bible or once a, a book is finished being studied, you have a party. You have a party. So we are going to pop some uh, champagne corks next week. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll commit right here and now to getting a little mini champagne bottle and okay. so we can do it. Up. Okay, let's make it happen. And, and, and listeners, this is, you know, you have been reading along with us, so get some champagne if you drink. And, uh, when you are done reading or listening to the episode next week, not this episode, but next week's be prepared to have some champagne. I'm just kind of excited to hear what the podcast sounds like if we're drinking champagne during it. Probably like (laughs) it always does. are you, are you saying you haven't been drinking throughout this whole thing? <laughs> I feel so alone now. Me and my bar peanuts over yep. here in Ohio. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Hattie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, we give a little chance for you to make any kind of shameless plug you want. Uh, is there anything you're working on right now or excited about or reading or watching that you want people to know about? You know, I feel like I should have some great things to say, but I, Daniel knows this because he saw my Facebook post like two weeks ago is like when I entered the podcast world and I'm just so excited to like be soaking in all of this information. And ah, so I can't even hone in on one thing because there's so much. So I'm like a giddy, like new kid in a candy shop with podcasts. (laughs) Wow. That's great. So thank you for having me here just to listen and Thanks for learn along Any with you podcast all. you listen to yeah. that you've loved, do you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, you know, I do. I have been listening a ton to my friend Colleen Powell's Year of Listening. Um, she is, you know, a, a suburban mom um, like me and a good friend of mine. And um, this entire year she spent, she sat down each week with a different guest talking about um, a controversial topic. So she sat down with a former NFL player this week just to talk about um, what it means to kneel for the flag and the national anthem and has a fascinating conversation each week just from a new perspective. And it's all about listening and learning cool. together. And um, I met her when we were in youth ministry together a few years ago. So definitely check out. So say the name of the podcast one a more time. A Year of Listening. A Year of Listening. Cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, my little plug, I guess, will be that um, the spiritual director training program that I'm teaching in for the first time this year uh, starts on Friday. Um, so I am excited about that. I'm really looking forward to it. And I just found out that the president will be at a hospital maybe four blocks from where it's hap- where where the school 
is run the evening we start. And so the question is whether anyone will actually be able to get there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause he's going from there, I think like up to campus. And, uh, so it'll be quite the thing. Um, but at any rate, if people could keep the well streams program in their hearts and minds, I would appreciate that. What about you, Daniel? What have you got? I, so I'm going to give a plug for an article I read this week that I can't get out of my head. Uh, it's by David Roberts over at Vox. And the title of the article is The Radical Moral Implications of Luck in Human Life. Uh, yeah. And I'll just give you the subtitle here because I think it says it all. Acknowledging the role of luck is the secular equivalent of religious awakening. Hmm. Right. Because it, uh, to acknowledge it means to admit that we're not in control. Yeah. And sort of his, his greater point is that once it's very threatening to recognize that almost all of the nature and almost all of the nurture that has led to me being where I am in this moment had nothing to do with my own effort or my own worth, uh, but just dumb wow. luck. And once you can acknowledge that you understand your obligations to those who have had less luck which is different than if you say, I built this. Right. Right. Yeah. I started to read, I did not finish the article, but he starts out by talking about one of the Kardashians, I think. Right. And uh, well, in, so I assume you found the article because you have a Google news alert waiting for the Kardashians. <laughs> uh, I always do. I always do, you know, um, because I like <laughs> bling. Because <I'm> <laughs> 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 all right all right dear listeners thank you for listening to lost in the wilderness um our podcast is made possible by very kind funding from christ church cathedral in the diocese of southern ohio our theme music is provided by brianna kelly i hope you all have a great week bye y'all bye